From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew. A day after the collapse of Baltimore's Key Bridge, the recovery mission continues with six people now presumed dead. And more questions about rebuilding and funding. We'll have highlights of my conversation today with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and California Congressman John Garamendi will join us live. Another retirement from Congress, this time a Democrat from New Hampshire. We'll take stock of where we sit with a slew of retirements as well as resignations on both sides of the aisle. And Israel and the U.S. trying to restore a meeting on Gaza now after the U.S. allowed a ceasefire resolution to move ahead in the U.N. Security Council. Carmel Arbit of the Atlantic Council will be with us later this hour. Thanks for joining us. We'll have a lot more on that still ahead. We begin with our top story here. Six people, as I mentioned, now presumed dead. After the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore yesterday, investigators have recovered the data recorder, the black box, if you will, from the ship that caused that collapse. They boarded the boat last night, but the fate of the ship and of the harbor remain unclear. Maryland Governor Wes Moore speaking with reporters earlier today. It's a huge economic impact for the country. This is not just impacting Maryland. This is impacting that farmer in Kentucky. It's impacting that auto dealer in Michigan. And so it is imperative that we get this bridge rebuilt. It's imperative that we get the Port of Baltimore back up and going. And it's not just about how we're supporting Maryland. This is about how we support the American economy. Joining us now at the table, Bloomberg's Peggy Collins and Jonathan Tamari of Bloomberg Government. It's great to have both of you with us. Uh, Peggy, we just gave the update on where things stand. And there are so many questions that we cannot answer yet, including the duration of what Pete Buttigieg is describing as a very complicated project and the timeline, not to mention how we're going to pay for it. This debate over funding is about to get underway. What's it going to look like? Well, our colleague at Bloomberg Government, Zach Cohen, just released a stat from his reporting on the Hill that there are estimates uh, it will cost about $2 billion to fix it. We've already heard President Biden come out and say that he wants the government to foot the bill, but that will involve a number of things, potentially funding from the infrastructure bill, funding from the Department of Transportation, and likely some type of supplemental from Congress. And as we've seen time and time again, getting things through Congress is not smooth right now. Well, that's absolutely right. Right. Two billion dollars. That's really important. And I'm glad that you mentioned that, Peggy. It's the first time I've heard a number on this. Jonathan, what's Congress going to say? What will Republicans in the House say? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be smooth sailing, as Peggy mentioned. Uh, if you think back to Superstorm Sandy a little while back and there was a push for emergency aid right then for New York and New Jersey, there was a lot of resistance from Republicans. And they said any new spending needed to be offset with cuts. Mm -hmm. Democrats said, no, this is an emergency. We don't, you know, hold an, a, a state or a city hostage over when they're having a, an emergency. And I think you kind of those comments from Governor Moore were almost anticipating some of this fight where he was saying sure. this isn't just a Maryland issue. It affects other states as well. Yeah, right. I spoke earlier as I mentioned, with the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. He spoke about how the ship's cargo currently is being handled. Just give us a sense of how delicate this whole operation is. Let's listen. What we're seeing right now is other ports are preparing to absorb uh, some of those shipments. It really depends, though, on the type of shipment. That's exactly why uh, we're so glad that this freight office is up and running. This was created by the president's bipartisan infrastructure package. Uh, we stood it up in accordance with, the, uh, with that legislation, and it is coming in hand. This is not air traffic control. There's no one uh, uh, kind of tower, so to speak, or authority that tells ships where to go uh, the way you have for aircraft. Uh, they are independent actors. Uh, we're bringing them to the table to make sure that there's better coordination He's going to be holding an important meeting tomorrow uh, with supply chain stakeholders, as the White House likes to say. This is not the first time, though, as he talks about this freight office, that this White House has had to deal uh, with supply chain issues. We think about what's happening in the Red Sea and we bring it all the way back to COVID. 
That's right, Joe. I mean, supply chain shocks shocks have been one of the biggest things that this economy has had to deal with for several years now. Mm -hmm. Our chief U.S. economist, Anna Wong, had a piece out today that notes that one of the things the country is trying to deal with is inflation coming down. And one of the things that has been a part of that is car prices. You know, we talk so much about used car prices and car prices during the pandemic, Mm -hmm. and we have seen those coming down. The The Port of Baltimore is very much so important when it comes to auto automobiles. And so the question is whether or not those prices will start to rise if that port is out of commission for a long period of time and things have to get di- diverted to places like right. Newark or even the West Coast. Well, and you wonder if some of these diversions could be permanent to the detriment of Baltimore and the local economy there. Getting back to the transportation secretary, before I spoke with him uh, earlier today on Bloomberg, he held forth in the briefing room at the White House. Here's what he told reporters. What we do know is a bridge like this one, completed in the 1970s, was simply not made to withstand a direct impact on a critical support pier from a vessel that weighs about 200 million pounds, orders of magnitude bigger than cargo ships that were in service in that region at the time that the bridge was first built. That's really important, uh, Jonathan, because it tells us this is not really an infrastructure problem. This was a bridge that was up to code. And this is going to come back to who is at fault at some point. And I wonder what the response will be from Congress on that specific issue. The president says the federal government should rebuild it before we start deal- dealing with who is at fault or liabilities. Yeah, and I think it dovetails with kind of the image that President Biden has tried to put forward from the start of his presidency, that he's yeah. the infrastructure president, that he's the guy who's going to rebuild things. It was one of his first really big That's signature right. pieces of legislation. So even though it's... Highly unlikely this will get rebuilt in time for the election. He and his administration are going to want to show progress uh, and, and, and to kind of basically build on the Biden brand as they mm-hmm. head towards an election. We've got another hit uh, from Congress today. Another departure, Annie Custer in this case, representative from New Hampshire, a Democrat. Jonathan, I, I've lost count at this point. I think we're beyond 40 resignations in this Congress, and it is both sides of the aisle. What's going on? It is, and it's a little surprising because usually you see one side leaving, kind of heading for the hills when they realize they're going to be in the minority. Yeah. And Democrats are pretty confident they're going to gain the majority. And so Custer, you would think, would, would relish that. Um, she is the chair of the New Democrats. I, I don't know how much longer she would have been able to remain in the chair, so it's possible that she's term limited there. I also just think Congress has not been a fun place to be for well, the past two it, years. It? You know, there's just so hard to get things done. There's so much fighting going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think a lot of people are not enjoying their work there right now. Annie Custer, who is in front of that uh, that uh, write-in campaign for Joe <laughs> Biden in the primary that wasn't in New Hampshire. You know, Peggy, I'd ask you if this was a generational turnover, but the fact is it's not. Look at Mike Gallagher. So many young lawmakers are leaving as well. Is this the worst job in the world? Well, I think, as we were just talking, it has become a place that's incredibly politically divided. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in the past have gone into Congress because they actually think they can make a difference in the country. And I think that's what we're really at the crossroads of. And we are in an election year, right? Um, And Trump is on the um, on the ballot with Biden. um, And that is something that is also facing people in Congress very much so in in the face in terms of whether or not they want to see this through into 2020. Well, the generational change, it appears, will not be coming in the presidential campaign as we talk more about the age of these two gentlemen, just about any policy that they're talking about. Peggy, Joe Biden's going to be on stage with Bill Clinton and Barack Obama tomorrow, a fundraiser in New York, putting the band back together again. Does that help him bringing the former presidents on the stage to make him look younger, more relevant, remind people of the good old days? What's the point? Well, I think it certainly rallies the base, yeah. right? It gets people excited about the history of the Democratic Party in, in our generation and time. I think one of the other things to note that we've been reporting on here in D.C. Yeah. is the delta in terms of the money raised. You know, Biden does That's have a clear advantage, and it is when it comes to fundraising and the money that he has, he and the Democratic Party have been able to raise. Mm-hmm. And this is another way to get more people out to potentially get farther ahead on the money front while Absolutely. Trump is dealing with his legal battle and legal fines. Of course, it's not a mistake that this is taking place in New York. President's going up to the ATM in Manhattan here. And if you show up with Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, mm-hmm. that's a win, right? You hail from New Jersey. This is <laughs> Clinton and Obama country. Yeah, it's very blue territory. And he's going to be up there with people who, frankly, are more popular than yeah. he is, which is Isn't I'm sure that, that, that they're hoping that that rubs off on the president and just reminds people in general of, you know, 
other Democrats who have won the popular vote, who've won the Electoral College twice, yeah. um, and, and kind of reminds them of the party brand writ large, even if President Joe Biden himself is not particularly popular right now. That's right. We'll have a lot more on that event tomorrow here. And of course, much more on the situation in Baltimore in the days and weeks ahead. Our thanks to Jonathan Tamari and Peggy Collins for a great conversation to get us rolling tonight. Coming up, Democratic Congressman John Garamendi of California, a member of the House Transportation Committee, will join with his take on this. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I think there's already outreach efforts going on. As you know, we've had um, challenges in the House in particular with respect to just passing basic legislation. But we've been able to get some things done when necessary. The last week, it just passed the bill, $1.1 trillion funding bill for uh, keeping the government open. And I'm hoping that this will be the type of tragedy that brings people together instead of um, pushing uh, you know, people into partisan corners. Maryland Congressman Glenn Ivey talking with me earlier, the early edition of Balance of Power today. As we consider the job ahead in Baltimore and the cost of that job, replacing a 1.6 mile long bridge in a project that could take years. There's a debate that's about to get underway here in Washington about this. And one man who will be in the middle of it is California Democratic Congressman John Garamendi he serves on the Transportation Committee. And Congressman, it's great to see you. I appreciate your coming back. I keep hearing that this is going to be controversial, that this is not 2007 following the Minnesota bridge collapse. Is that true? Well, certainly the Congress of the United States is in total disarray. There's no doubt about it. The uh, Republicans really cannot do anything they always rely upon the Democrats. But I will tell you this. I think there's going to be a very, very strong desire, Democrat and Republican alike, certainly the Democrats, to rebuild this bridge. But I don't think it has to be federal taxpayer money. This was an accident that was caused by a shipping company. And there is a liability that they, in, that they have. And they're going to have to participate perhaps totally, in the cost of rebuilding what they have destroyed. And so that uh, let's first go to the insurance side of it, and then we'll see what's left over. With regard to the timing, it could take forever to get it built. But on the other hand, we can build quickly if there is a necessity to do so. And there is certainly a necessity here. The environmental issues are uh, should be secondary or maybe not even considered as a new bridge is designed and built. And maybe we don't even need a new design. There are bridges that are similar uh, purpose to this one. We can take a design out of an older bridge that may have been built in the last decade with modern standards. Yep. So let's get on with it. Uh, you're no stranger to the shipping industry, Congressman. You're not only on the Transportation Committee, but of course, uh, you spent quite a bit of time working your Ocean Shipping Reform Implementation Act into law. Does further reform uh, follow this accident? Is this a matter of additional regulations or simply holding this shipper accountable? Well, let's figure out what actually was the cause of all this. Clearly, this accident was caused by this ship, by Maresk, the, uh, who either owns the ship or has chartered the ship, and the ship owner. Yeah. So let's get that question first. Uh, with regard to additional regulations or requirements, perhaps, perhaps so. Uh, but we don't know the answer to that question until we know what was the problem. Clearly, mm -hmm. um, the ship seems to have, well, I'm not going to speculate. Let's figure out what the problem was, and then we'll decide about additional regulations. Uh, the Coast Guard is certainly first up in order. Murad and other organizations uh, will also have to chime in, including possibly the Congress of the United States. One thing that's been determined uh, today by the Transportation Secretary, Congressman, is that this bridge was not designed to withstand the impact of a 200 million pound
cargo ship. This was not an infrastructure failure. This bridge was up to code. Do all bridges now need to be made at additional cost to withstand a ship strike like this, even if it's one that comes from operator error? Well, let me start with responsibility here. The responsibility for this accident, the collapse of this, was the shipping company, the owner of the ship and the charter of the ship. They have yeah. insurance. This may be a question right there. Do they have adequate insurance? Well, as a former insurance commissioner, that's the starting point for this entire discussion. The taxpayers mm -hmm. come in secondarily here, but really the first responsibility is the insurance company, probably Lloyd's of London, uh, that holds the insurance policy and then the company and the owner of the ship also. That's the first thing. Should there be better protection for, the sh for these uh, structures? The answer is yeah. probably yes, and that's something that we'll have to consider as we look at existing bridges. I know the first question that came to uh, my wife and I as we were looking at this uh, yesterday is, well, what if this happened in the in San Francisco? What if somebody were to take out yeah. the Bay Bridge, the Oakland, not the San Francisco Bay Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge? Uh, what yeah, would sure. that mean? Well, that would shut down that entire area also. So. We need to look at the safety precautions. These are the fenders or the uh, structures that protect the uh, critical uh, foundation for the bridge. Is that something that your transportation committee will work on, Congressman? I, I suspect that would uh, require legislation to implement regulations like that. Would your Republican colleagues sign on to additional regulations? I would hope so. Uh, I think what we're looking at here is the use of the infrastructure money. We have two bridge programs in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. One bridge program is an ongoing program about uh, 400 to 600 million dollars a year, grant programs around the nation for all the bridges in the nation. Then there is the mega bridge program for very, very large projects. Perhaps this is one. I know that there are a couple of others around the nation. Uh, the tunnel underneath the Hudson River uh, in New York, New Jersey. That's a mega project specifically done. Not a bridge, but a mega project. There are a couple of other mega bridge projects that have already been allocated. It may be that the additional money beyond insurance necessary for this project could come from the mega bridge or from the normal bridge grant program. And that's where you might see the owners of bridges, for example, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge Authority uh, in California yeah. may want to seek some additional money from the federal government, as well as their own money, to build a better fender around the uh -huh. critical that's foundation. Right. Can we just be clear, Congressman, we're out of time, but can you tell our viewers and listeners that the Golden Gate Bridge could withstand a strike from a ship like that or could not? I don't know, but I'm absolutely certain that the Golden Gate Bridge Authority is asking themselves that question. And Good I would course. suspect that every out. other bridge owner is similarly asking a question just like that. Congressman, I'm glad you could join us. John Garamendi of California, we thank you for the time thank again you. today on Bloomberg. Coming up, we'll take a closer look at the changing economic fortunes of one state and what it could mean for the presidential election. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. Thanks for joining. The economic recovery of one key swing state could bode well for President Biden in the upcoming election. Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief Emeritus Matthew Winkler writing in Bloomberg Opinion that after struggling under former President Trump, quote, Michigan is poised to reclaim its leadership role in the U.S. economy with Biden in the White House, unquote. Mr. Winkler, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining, as always, on Balance of Power. You start your column, however, with an acknowledgement of reality. If the election were held today, Michigan would choose Donald Trump over Joe Biden. But you're looking across the valley. What do you see? 
Well, the valley is that Michigan is in the best shape it's been, uh, certainly since COVID, and it's in the best shape it's been in actually quite some time. And the way we know that is uh, the job market in Michigan has almost completely rebounded from where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, it's going to get there within a month or so. And it's a complete reversal of where it was during the Trump presidency when it was third worst from the bottom of the 50 states. And we also know this because we look at uh, something called the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank coincident indexes, which show that uh, through a variety of metrics, the standard of living in Michigan is much higher today than it was under Trump. And that, by the way, includes that issue that everybody brings up called inflation. It means that yeah. people are actually living better. Um, their cost of living is actually lower uh, than it was under Trump. So you put all of that together, um, it's a relative boom. And we do know that uh, there's often a lag between when people actually express yes. uh, how they're feeling. But in the case of polls, I, I should add, they really have proved quite misleading. Just look at the Alabama <laughs> special election yesterday. Nobody saw oh, that one that? coming, right? And, mm -hmm. and the people who uh, are pushing polls don't mention that one uh, because it says that polls are often very misleading. And they are actually in this case because uh, when you go to, say, a Pew poll of last year and it asks, the very same people who say the economy isn't performing well, well, how are you doing? And they say, well, I'm doing great. Uh, and those are the same people. So you can't have it both ways. But the data well, so is, not, is not in any way ambiguous. It's emphatic. Yeah, well, you said something important there. It sounds to me then that, that Joe Biden's greatest asset right now is time. Is His greatest right? asset actually is facts. The facts are yeah. indisputable. Uh, polls are ephemeral and are a perception. And if you look at the way people have voted, right in my backyard, Long Island, everybody said the Long Island election that replaced the Santos seat would be too close to call, and he won it by That's eight right. percentage points. So polls are actually misleading. The facts get stronger as we go. Well, I'll tell you what, that's music to Joe Biden's ears when you consider the lag effects, as you discussed uh, just now, and the trajectory of this economy pulling off potentially a soft landing or no landing in the next eight months. He could have a much uh, more interesting story to tell. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Matthew Winkler. Find the column on the terminal and online. Great to see you, sir. Coming up, we'll be joined by Carmel Arbit of the Atlantic Council as we turn our attention to the situation in Israel and the hope for a ceasefire in Gaza. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. In Gaza today, the number of civilian casualties is far too high, and the amount of humanitarian aid is far too low. Gaza is suffering a humanitarian catastrophe, and the situation is getting even worse. We need immediate increases in assistance to avert famine. Our work to open a temporary humanitarian corridor by sea will help. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin yesterday as he met with his Israeli counterpart at the Pentagon uh, with a very stern message. As we turn now to Carmel Arbit of the Atlantic Council and her take on what's happening in Israel or not happening, depending on who you ask. Carmel, it's great to see you. The IDF says that it has dismantled 20 of the original 24 Hamas battalions. The four remaining fully operational battalions, they say, are now all in Rafah. The U.S. is, of course, urging restraint, asking Israel to not advance with this invasion. What would it take for Israel to dismantle the remaining four? Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. According to the Israeli calculation, they cannot win this war against Hamas without going into Rafah. This has become a flashpoint 
in terms of tensions with the United States, because even where we've seen political tensions, we haven't seen real policy di disagreements. But Rafah is one of them. Um, and so right now, the Israelis in the U.S. are continuing to discuss what the future will hold vis-a-vis -vis an Israeli incursion in Rafah. But it is very hard to envision a scenario where this war ends without one. And that could come at a great, great cost to Palestinian civilians. Well, we're talking about sort of two conversations at once here, Carmel. There's the conversation about uh, Rafa, and of course Israel says it will move into Rafa with or without U.S. support. There's also the conversation uh, about a ceasefire. I'm not really sure how we get to both at once here, but negotiators could be back at the table soon, despite this flap over the U.N. Security Council vote. I'd like for you to hear from Benjamin Netanyahu. The prime minister spoke earlier in Jerusalem about the current pressure placed on Israel following that vote. I think the bad thing about the U.S. decision and the United Nations Security Council was that it encouraged Hamas to take hard line and to believe uh, that international pressure will prevent Israel from they bring the hostages and destroy Hamas. Carmel, he wanted the U.S. to veto uh, that resolution, not just a vote in abstention, as we saw. Is there time to put this back together? We're hearing talk now of that delegation from Israel being restored. The U.S. made very clear after it abstained from the vote that it abstained and did not veto it because the resolution still called for a ceasefire and for the release of hostages. And it not only called for a ceasefire, it called for a temporary ceasefire. And that's really where yeah. the division exists now between Israelis and where Hamas is. Israel is saying we're open to a temporary ceasefire with certain conditions, and Hamas has continued to say that that has to be permanent. I think we're going to still see negotiations move forward. Um, there is both parties have an interest in coming to some kind of a temporary ceasefire agreement, no matter how difficult it is for them to arrive at that place. So while the U.N. may have the vote at the U.N. may have added to frictions that are happening now between the U.S. and Israel, I don't think that it undermined any discussions around a ceasefire in any meaningful way. So where is this going in the next couple of days here then? Could this coincide with the end of Ramadan? What's your expectation, Carmel? It's very hard to say at this point. The two sides are very far apart. Again, the question being whether it will be a permanent ceasefire or a temporary ceasefire, with the U.S. continuing to back that temporary ceasefire. From the Israeli perspective, um, they think that the more Hamas is suffering, and frankly, the more Gaza suffers, the incentives for a temporary ceasefire will grow. Um, Hamas, again, is looking for a permanent end here. It is very hard to predict how soon that ceasefire will come, but it is inevitably we will arrive at this place. The war is not going to go on forever. The Israeli government has been very clear about that. We are coming, we're talking about weeks and months, not for the years. So it's really just a matter of time at this point and who gains or loses what with each day that yes. passes. Well, and we can't see real distribution of aid, Carmel until there is a ceasefire. We're trying to work around this with airdrops. We're talking about building a temporary port. Will those be necessary or could a ceasefire come first? But the challenge of aid right now is formidable. Um, the Israelis will say, we're letting all the aid in that they could possibly need. More aid is going in than had ever gone in before. It's important to remember that two thirds of Gazans had been reliant on food assistance even before this war had happened. But the reality is that not enough aid is getting to the people who need it. And that's not going to be solved even when the war ends or even during a ceasefire. And part of the reason is that the infrastructure within Gaza has been so destroyed that aid may be gathering in the south, but not getting to the people who need it in the north. And then you have the problem of things like airdrops and ports, which are slow and costly and not meeting the demands. So again, nothing is gonna be resolved overnight. It will take a long time to address this crisis. Well, that's for sure. I wonder what we're going to be talking about here weeks or months from now. The president is dealing with a fraught political situation here at home with pushback from progressives. Uh, even his own White House, we're hearing from the vice president, in this case, Kamala Harris, uh, talking about repercussions if Israel should move into Rafah. Uh, is there going to be a red line 
that's drawn by this White House? So we haven't heard it yet, but what we are seeing is frictions mounting. It's important, as I said at the mm-hmm. beginning, we have to differentiate the politics and the policy. Right now, the politics are becoming increasingly fraught. Netanyahu is pandering to a right-wing domestic audience while he tries to retain his coalition, probably going after the Biden administration, showing that he doesn't need the U.S., when in fact Israel knows that they do. Biden, on the other hand, and the administration have to be responsive to an American public that, as polls are showing, is decreasingly supportive of this war. And so both sides are really trying to see how to speak to that public audience while moving forward in a policy way that makes sense for both countries. I'm glad you could join. As always, Carmel Arbit, thanks for being back with us, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Coming up, President Biden is promising federal support to rebuild after the Baltimore bridge collapse. Our political panel will get into the latest developments on this and a lot more next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington with breaking news as it is now being reported that former Senator Joe Lieberman has died. Most recently, a national co-chair to the No Labels operation. We, in fact, just spoke with him last week about their effort to get a candidate on the ballot to run against Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Of course, a longtime veteran of the Democratic Party, although he served as well as an independent in his Last cup of coffee in the U.S. Senate. 24 years in the upper chamber. Joe uh, Lieberman, of course, uh, also ran as a vice presidential candidate, the vice presidential nominee with Al Gore in the year 2000, thrown into, of course, one of the most remarkable uh, recounts in modern presidential history. Joe Lieberman, the gentleman from Connecticut, has died at 82. Joining us now, our political panel, Lauren Tomlinson is with us, partner at Steer PR and Alvin Jordan of Rock Solutions, neither of whom were prepared to talk about this, but that's the way things go. Uh, Alvin, his legacy in the Democratic Party, even though he ended his tenure as an independent, would be described how? Uh, I would just say as one of those titans, um, Mm -hmm. just like one of the names that, you know, kind of when you come into the the world of kind of policy and and just life on the hill, just one of those names that kind of sticks, right? Um, You said the gentleman from Connecticut, that was kind of my first thought as Mm -hmm. we were kind of thinking about this uh, or talking about this just a quick second ago. And, you know, I think just in a year where we're starting to see, uh, you know, a handful of people start to kind of bow out and, and retire, um, it's kind of the opposite with, with, with Lieberman in the sense that, like, again, like one of those names that's been around and kind of dedicated, yeah. um, you know, kind of, his, the, you know, the majority of his life for that matter to, to you know, democracy in the, the country in that way. And so definitely a, a loss for sure. Yeah. And, you know, you think about the generational turnover here, Lauren, that's something that, that you know a lot about having uh, spent some time in Washington. Uh, This is a generation of leaders that uh, is we're we're quickly losing here in Washington and not replacing them always very well. Yeah, you know, with Senator Lieberman, he was that same class where he was serving in the Senate with Joe Biden. He was serving in the Senate with my former boss, Saxby Chambliss, uh, John McCain. You think about all of these names and they served for a really long time Mm -hmm. as well. And it was a different age back then when they were all in the Senate together. You know, there was a lot of bipartisanship. There was a lot of working together. They were all very friendly um, with one another. And so I think, you know, we talk about even the generational change um, of how the Senate is evolving with the new members that are coming in and how um, how populism and some of the politics of the day have kind of changed and made that bipartisanship yeah. a little less uh, popular for That's members right. to pursue. Joe Lieberman's death, I think, gives us a, a glimpse to remember a time when people were still wanting to work together in that in well, the chamber. Despite his legacy as, as, a, as a veteran of the Democratic Party, Alvin, he's been giving Democrats uh, some agita recently with this no labels turn. Um, he was one of the, the the last remaining party co-chairs, if we can even call no labels a party. It's really not. What was he trying to get done here after all that time in the Democratic Party? Well, I think kind of what, in essence, the country is, is hoping for, which is just a, an opportunity to have a candidate that represents um, kind of a full picture of, you know, obviously one one party in particular, but, but you know, a 
a broader group, a broader, I think, approach and point of view for the country. And I sure. think, um, you know, part of, you know, to Lauren's point, kind of that old guard is like, you know, how can we continue to, to work together or maneuver, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of with and around each other to, to actually get to something that helps us all. And so, you know, I think on some level that had to be kind of one of those, you know, God intended for him in that way. And so, you know, regardless of how it came across, um, I think that, you know, people out of his camp would say that he was definitely definitely kind of fighting for the the greater democracy in that way and yeah. I think that that's something that kind of always followed him regardless of it sounds like you see felt. him though as as being well intended despite some some real criticism from, uh, from well, Democrats. Uh, uh, Sure, uh, well intended for sure, maybe, but I, I think more so of just kind of the the goal of like democracy being yeah. kind of at, at the forefront, and mm-hmm. I think that can be respected, especially with some of the shenanigans we see um, coming uh, from yeah. the hill these days on a more consistent basis. Um, is one of those things where you can you know kind of look to see or. Some, expect someone to be kind of where you you know you expect them to be as opposed to kind of popping up all over the place. Sure. And so in that way, I think that can be respected. Thoughts from Alvin Jordan and, of course, uh, Lauren Tomlinson with breaking news uh, here on Bloomberg. Joe Lieberman has died, the former senator from Connecticut, former uh, vice presidential nominee for the Democratic Party, was 82 years old. We'll have a lot more ahead on Bloomberg TV and radio. The Supreme Court heard a case to gut access to medication that was approved by the FDA 20 years ago to give women a choice. Folks, if America sends me a Congress that are Democrats, I promise you, Common and I will restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. President Biden in Raleigh, North Carolina, just yesterday, as the Supreme Court was hearing arguments about potentially restricting access to mifepristone, the abortion pill, at least through the mail. Back with us now, our political panel, Lauren Tomlinson, partner at Steer PR, is at the table, along with Alvin Jordan of Rock Solutions. Lauren, this has seen the issue of abortion as a major problem for Republicans going into this general election. We've seen a number of specials, including one just yesterday in Alabama, but also the midterm elections where this has been hanging over Republican candidates. This renewal of the conversation based on the Supreme Court case in Washington now has Joe Biden with this back in the stump speech again. Are there single issue voters who Republicans will just never win over on this? Yes, um, I do think that any time that abortion uh, policy is on the table, um, it is to the benefit of Democrats because uh, Republicans have traditionally had a really difficult time um, sketching out a more moderate position in which is we see the uh, the polling um, for Americans overwhelmingly support um, very moderate policies uh, for abortion. I think this is why you saw Nikki Haley um, early on um, go out and support, for example, after Roe v. Wade was overturned more of a 15-week um, compromise around that. Um, it's mm-hmm. why you see Trump backtracking on it as well and making sure that um, he doesn't isolate the pro-life, very active base of Republican politics, but uh, still it gives a nod towards um, those independent voters, um, especially women yeah. all across the country that really care about this issue and access. I think the problem with the Supreme Court continuing to have to weigh in on these is that it leaves so many questions about the um, abortion access care um, that women are having to deal with. And, you know, pregnancy and child care and um, and birth and fertility, all of those are very complicated issues for women. Um, and they are very motivating. Um, and so I think that any time it's across party lines, I think you're going to see this issue continue to really motivate women. And they're an important voting block um, in presidential elections. Well, that's for sure. The IVF ruling by the Supreme Court in Alabama was really what put this back on the front page, back on the front burner here. And Uh, Remarkable to see what happened there yesterday, Alvin. Marilyn Lands, not a household name. This is a state rep, not a member of Congress. Flipped the seat to Democrats after running on this issue in the wake of the IVF ruling. Can we actually extrapolate a national trend from what happened there, or at least add to what we think is one? Well, I I think Lauren just kind of mentioned, or at least you know, hit on it uh, somewhat, which is it's a motivating issue. It is. Um, I think for the Biden administration, you know, almost a, a breath of fresh air in the sense that it gives them something to actually come back out in mm-hmm. which 
ears will listen to what they have to say. Sure. And so I would just expect to see more of it. It's one of those, you know, if the defense can't stop it, let's keep running the same play type of situation. It sure so, seems like it. Like, this wasn't in Massachusetts. This was in Alabama. That's right. Exactly. Like, How does it would, that come out when you, when you look at the country as a whole, though? Well, because you factor in blue states and you've got a story to tell. Taking the policy aside and just looking at the issue on its on its just merits. Yeah. It's something that, you know, is one of those things that, you know, more people not only care about, but are starting to talk about in a way that I think, um, you know, is, is just more on the forefront. Like it, it is. I mean, post Dobbs, like it is something that I think is is truly lighting a fire under you know vast just swarms of people, regardless of where you fall. And I think uh, the Biden administration will continue to play up. Well, obviously, it's going to be a massive campaign issue, along with things like the border, along with the economy. And you wonder how some voters are going to stack these. It's starting to sound like, and based on what I heard earlier this hour, that funding this bridge replacement in Baltimore is going to be a campaign issue. It's certainly going to be a debate here after the president asked for a fully federally funded replacement. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg joined me earlier to talk about this recovery effort. Here he is. We're going to process this request immediately. We've got to make sure that funding is not a source of delay in getting to work. And even this afternoon, our Federal Highways Administration team already sitting down with the Maryland DOT to talk design, procurement, and what it's going to take to uh, uh, to scope and launch that project of getting a new bridge built. Lauren, he's talking about an emergency funding request from the state of Maryland. The administration will, of course, act on that. What is the congressional debate? over what we're now hearing is going to be a $2 billion price tag on a bridge. Yeah, I mean, they had enough trouble just passing like their normal appropriations bills right. recently. Um, but traditionally, this is something the supplemental um, funding for things like this has been very popular. Mm -hmm. um, bridges are just something that the country needs. So even yes, though sir. that there's big price tags, um, I don't anticipate that there is going to be a huge fight here. So maybe it's not controversial. We're going to hear about some public-private partnership. What would be preferred, yeah. if not this? Well, I think that some, something like that, I think, will come if there's the liability issues that I think uh, the transportation secretary uh, mentioned yeah. at some point that there may be some sort of that con you know basically the federal government needs to act, Congress needs to act. We need to get this bi bridge built because it has so much um, of an impact on our uh, infrastructure and, uh, like we said, shipping and everything else, mm -hmm. um, people getting their goods and services. But um, ultimately. If it comes down that there are the liability that the company is going to have to also pay, then you could see more of you know them having to pay back or some sort of private uh, sure. public-private partnership there. Well, I suspect he's going to be talking about this tomorrow. A massive fundraiser in New York. Joe Biden sharing a stage with Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. This is like the Democrat Mount Rushmore, basically. But I have to ask you, Alvin, about this while we have some time. Barack Obama brings something quantifiable brings a few things quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Bill Clinton potentially brings a lot of baggage. And before I have you answer that, we're going to go listen to Wes Moore. The governor of Maryland has just begun speaking at a briefing at the bridge collapse site. Let's listen live on Bloomberg. To begin search and rescue. This morning, we had divers in the water starting at 6 a.m. for search and recovery. This is not a conclusion. It's a continuation. And we take this phase just as seriously and just as personally as we took the last phase. And I want to thank, as always, all of our first responders, the Maryland State Police, the Coast Guard, the Natural Resources Police, Baltimore City Police Departments in Baltimore County, Baltimore City. Westmore speaking George live County, there with an update. We'll let you know if he delivers any breaking news on the situation uh, in this recovery effort, we still have six people uh, presumed dead. And of course, a massive project underway that begins with clearing the way in the port with the cleanup and restoration of operations in the port of Baltimore. There are still some 40 ships that are locked in the port here carrying cargo, and they have begun taking cargo off of those ships while we wait to see the dolly itself moved. It is currently holding hazardous materials among uh, other 
cargo in those containers, and so they're taking a very slow and uh, methodical approach at that. It's something that will keep you posted on here with divers and submersibles getting back in the water today to gauge the level of damage potentially on the bottom of that ship. I'm sorry we were interrupted in our conversation with Lauren Tomlinson and Alvin Jordan. I thank both of our panelists as always, and I can assure you they will be back soon. Thanks to you both, along with Kaylee Lyons, by the way, who's been on duty in Baltimore. She'll be back here with us tomorrow on Balance of Power. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online for news on all the stories we talked about today. And thank you for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Bloomberg TV and radio.